Hi, micro folks. Um, this is um, Professor Carberry, and this is Friday, March 13th, 2020. The first day our campus is closed because of the novel coronavirus outbreak. So um, what I'll try to do today is make a few videos of the things we would be working with in the lab. And then when I'm at home, I'll pull up our lab manual and walk over some of the details from the lab manual. So this is going to be mostly for, for visuals. Um, the reason is we've been told that starting next Tuesday, we can't come onto campus. We can't come into our labs. We can't come into our offices. So this is going to make it a little bit more challenging, but we can do it. All right. So you guys, I'm going to go headless here. So we'll have more screen for our visuals. So folks, what we're first going to do is start with um, chapter 10 in our lab manual. And chapter 10 is on microbial growth media. Um, and so media is the term we use to describe food for our microbes. So in the labs to be able to study our microbes, to be able to identify them, to be able to do, for example, antibiotic um, sensitivity testing, we have to be able to grow our microbes. So um, it's important that we know their nutritional needs so we can give them the right medium, the right food. So I'm just going to give you some examples of media here, folks. Um, so one type of medium is called broth, right? And broth, just like you might think of chicken broth or vegetable broth, it's basically soup that has nutrients in it um, for our microbes to grow. Now there's different recipes, just like there's different recipes for soup, there's different recipes for broth. The one we commonly use is called triptych triptychase soy broth, or TSB. And triptychase soy um, medium is defined as an all-purpose medium, meaning it should be able to grow a wide range of both um, bacteria and fungi. A disadvantage of broth, and, and we'll, we'll follow up with this, we'll do some inoculations and we'll incubate them and I'll come back this weekend and we'll take photos of them. A problem with broth is that if cells are present, the broth will appear cloudy or turbid. Um, but we can't tell just by looking at the broth if the culture is pure, meaning a single type of micro present. And in diagnostic microbiology and in doing antibiotic sensitivity testing, it's really important we have pure cultures. Otherwise, our test results will be meaningless. So with broth cultures, you can't guarantee that your culture is pure. You just know that cells are present. This was the disadvantage that Louis Pasteur's lab had when they were trying to prove the germ theory of disease. They All they had to work with were liquid um, cultures, broth cultures, and therefore they could never guarantee they had a pure culture. Um, one thing we'll see in later uh, lab manual chapters when we start doing bio, um, biochemical or metabolic tests, um, we can include different ingredients in our media. So for example, we're going to be, um, in chapter 17, we'll be working with methyl red broth to test for mixed acid fermentation. Um, we'll be, in chapter 16, um, we'll be testing the ability of our microbes to ferment different sugars. Um, and so for example, this is PR lactose, which means phenyl red lactose. PR stands for the pH indicator phenyl red. Um, lactose is the only sugar present. So we'll be talking about how if we inoculate our um, microbes into the PR lactose, if they can ferment lactose, they'll make acids. That'll drop the pH. And the pH indicator, what's giving this broth a red color, it's called phenyl red. And phenyl red will turn yellow at acidic pH. So that's how we're going to determine that our microbes could ferment lactose. So again, more more on this, folks, in Chapter 16 in our lab manual. Well, as we mentioned, um, a, um, um, a disadvantage of broth is we can't tell if our cultures are pure or not. So it was a huge advantage. And I'm just going to read this right out of the lab manual, you guys. So um, when uh, Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch they were competing to prove the germ theory of disease, and Koch's lab recognized a big problem with just having the broth media. They couldn't, they couldn't um, depend that they had pure culture, so they were trying to find something to solidify the medium. They tried using gelatin, which is an animal protein, but the problem is a lot of microbes can actually digest gelatin. They have the enzyme called gelatinase. And if the microbes digested the gelatin, it would switch from being solid back to being a liquid. So gelatin wasn't wasn't very good. So one of um, one of um, Robert Koch's colleagues that worked in the lab, he was describing this dilemma to his wife, um, Fran, Fran, Fanny Hesse, 
And the wife suggested to the husband that they try using auger, which was a solidifying agent that she used to make jellies. And auger is an extract, it's a, a polysaccharide, and this is, I'm just reading out of the lab manual, you guys. It's made of sulfated galactose and D-glucuronic acid molecules. It's found in the cell walls of marine red algae of the division Rhodophyta. I would never ask all of that detail in the lab exam. But the advantages of auger, um, number one, very few microbes can digest it. And that means that when you grow your microbes on, on auger, it won't liquefy because the microbes can't digest it. It melts at about 90 degrees Celsius, and once it, um, it's melted, it won't solidify until 42 degrees Celsius. And then once it's solidified, it won't melt on a typical hot Sacramento summer or when we put, say, our auger um, cultures into the incubator. We don't, we don't want them to melt. And so um, Robert Koch's lab then did uh, what... Fanny Hesse suggested they started using auger to solidify their media, and it was like magic. It was just perfect. So what we can now do to make solid media, the most common solidifying agent is auger. Um, we, can, we can add the auger before we autoclave the media, and then um, when the, the um, auger comes out of the um, autoclave, it'll still be hot and liquid. So what we can do is if, we, if the um, medium is in, say, test tubes, we can choose to let the auger cool and solidify at an angle, and this will create an auger slant. And uh, auger slants are nice because they have pretty big surface area. Um, we can inoculate, transfer our bacteria to the surface of the slant and let them grow aerobically. So this is a nice, efficient way to grow our microbes aerobically. Um, for some of our tests, we're going to see if our microbes can grow anaerobically, and so uh, we can use auger to test for anaerobic growth. You can see in this auger slant, there's quite a bit more auger in it, and this portion, which we call the butt, this is a, a what we call a big butt auger slant. So we can use our inoculating needle and um, stab the auger butt with our microbes down to the bottom, deposit the microbes there, then withdraw our needle, incubate, and if we can see the microbes are growing in the anaerobic butt, that suggests they can grow anaerobically. And then um, this will be chapter nine. Um, another example of, of auger is we can use them to test motility. And so this is an example of motility auger, which will inoculate for chapter nine. Now normally auger has, um, our auger media has an auger concentration of 1.5% which means 1.5 grams of auger for every 100 mils. With motility auger, because we want our microbes to be able to literally swim into the auger, we're gonna decrease the auger concentration. And I think we decrease it to around maybe 0.5, 0.4%, which means um, um, 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 grams of auger per 100 mils. Okay, so we, um, and, and just as we mentioned, we can add different ingredients to our broths. We can add different ingredients to our auger slant. So again, in chapter 17, we're gonna be using simon citrate auger slants to test for our microbes' ability to use um, citrate as a sole source of carbon. We're gonna be working in chapter 17 with these really cool auger slants called TSI slants for uh, triple sugar iron slants. They let us test for sugar fermentation. They let us test for um, the ability to produce hydrogen sulfide. Um, and again, we've incorporated pH indicator in here, phenol red. So we can add all sorts of goodies to our, our broths and our um, augers to let us help um, um, identify microbes down to the species level. Well, folks, um, this was a pretty short introduction. Oh, wait a minute. Right before I go, um, let me just talk about uh, auger plates, okay? So in chapter... In chapter 10, we're going to be discussing different types of recipes for um, auger plates. So we'll talk about triptych soy auger. This is classified as, as an all-purpose medium because it can grow a wide range of um, microbes, a wide range of fungi and bacteria, just as the triptych soy broth was all-purpose. right? So we'll be using this in an airborne microbe experiment to see how many airborne microbes can grow on these. Then also in the airborne experiment, airborne microbe experiment, we'll be using Sabarod's dextrose medium. This medium is called selective for fungi. 
and it's because it has a really high sugar concentration, high glucose dextrose concentration, and also it's been acidified. So most environmental bacteria don't grow well at low pHs, but in general, fungi can grow better at low pH. So by adding excess sugar, by lowering the pH, we're going to select for fungi, and select means we're going to permit them to grow, um, and then we'll inhibit, we'll stop the growth of most uh, bacteria. This next one, you guys, is this is so cool. This is called blood auger. So you take a basic all-purpose medium like triptych soy auger, and what you'll do is after autoclaving, while the medium is still liquid, you add whole blood. And it, um, it can be, I think very commonly they add sheep blood. And it's the sheep blood that gives the blood auger this bright red appearance. Now, blood auger is awesome. It's chock full of ingredients, all these preformed organic molecules, growth factors. So we can use blood auger to grow what we call fastidious bacterial pathogens, um, bacteria that have to have everything supplied to them. They can't make hardly anything for themselves. They have to have growth factors such as vitamins, amino acids, and... Um, the nitrogenous bases of nucleic acid supplied to them. So blood is a wonderful source of all those growth factors, all those preformed organic molecules. Um, so we call it an enrichment medium, and we always want to take um, like samples from, a, uh, say, a human patient that we think is suffering with a bacterial infection. We always want to take some of the sample and put it on blood auger to make sure the fastidious pathogens can grow. The other thing really cool about blood auger is it's differential based on hemolysis. Hemolysis is the, the breaking open, the lysis of red blood cells, and different microbes um, can cause different types of hemolysis, and that also is going to help us identify them. So blood auger enrichment differential based on hemolysis. The last plate we have here, folks, is an example of a uh, both a selective and differential medium. This is called McConkie's auger. It selects for gram-negative um, Enterobacteriaceae. These are gram-negative bacteria that have evolved to live in the intestines, thus enterics. Um, and then um, in addition, it's differential, so the Enterobacteriaceae that can grow, we can group them according to their ability to ferment lactose. So McConkie's is also differential based on lactose fermentation. There will be one more different, excuse me, selective differential medium, and I don't have a plate of it here. It's called MSA for mannitol salt auger. Um, mannitol salt has a really high concentration of sodium chloride, 7.5%. And that means 7.5 grams of sodium chloride per 100 mils. And that's going to inhibit most microbes that haven't evolved to live in a salty environment. Um, but one place, you guys, we find a salty environment is the surface of, of human skin, right? Because we sweat for evaporative cooling. Um, so the sweat has really high sodium chloride concentration. So the um, potential path pathogen, Staphylococcus aureus, and its other cousins, other staph species such as Staphylococcus epidermidis, they can grow in really high salt environments. So um, we say the mannitol salt auger selects for salt tolerant microbes such as members of the genus Staphylococcus. And then it's also differential based on mannitol um, fermentation. So we'll be able to distinguish between the highly pathogenic Staph aureus and its less, less virulent cousin staph epidermidis based on mannitol fermentation. And again, we'll have a pH indicator in there that will let us see whether the mannitol is fermented or not. Okay, folks, so I, I, I need to close here. They're having a workshop so I can learn how to do confer, confer Zoom with you all so we can still talk face-to-face. -face. So we'll, hopefully I can get this closed down, and then I'll show you how to inoculate these plates in another video. We'll incubate them, and then this weekend we'll come back and show you the results.